Welcome. Uh, we're coming to you live today from Melbourne Museum. My name is Beck Carland. I'm uh, a curator of history here at the museum and it's my job to research the history of our collections, which is a real privilege. And I'm joined today by Kim. Hi everyone, my name is Kimberly Moulton. I'm the Senior Curator for Southeastern Aboriginal Collections and I'm also an Aboriginal woman. My people are the Yorta Yorta people and I'd like to acknowledge the country that we're talking to you um, today from and the traditional owners are the Woiwurrung people and the Bunwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. So maybe after this session is finished you can talk about who the traditional owners are on your country. Terrific. And today we're joined by more than 300 students from all across Victoria, which is so great. And some of those schools we thought we'd read out so that you can get a sense of who has joined into this big classroom today. We've got Lindell Secondary College from Dandenong, hi, and St Joseph's in Springvale. Um, they're both Melbourne schools, but we've got Gippsland representing from Sale College today and Sacred Heart Primary School in Newport. We've also got Kundruk Primary and Kerrang Technical High School, Marist College Bendigo and Barham High School. Hi guys. And a special shout out to those last couple of schools, Kundruk Primary and Kerrang Technical High School and Barnum High School in New South Wales are all local schools to the area where we're going to be doing the Bioscan. So I can't wait to meet you. We're doing a school hall uh, event in Kerrang, uh, sorry, in Kahuna, the week of the Bioscan, and I hope you'll all be there and we can meet you. Um, we've also got um, a number of locals from the Gunnawarra Shire joining us from the community room. Now, I'm not sure how many of you there are there, but big shout out to um, everybody there. Maybe you could go into the chat room and give us a sense of how many people are there. Um, it's great to have you joining us today. And remember, everybody, we have the chat room available for questions. So throughout the session, please send us in your questions. Yeah. Um, but the reason we've invited you here today is that we're all about, like all the experts here, are about to go on a survey study in the Gunnawarra Shire in the north of Victoria. And I think there's a map we can put up there. Um, so you can see on the map there, hopefully, where you're all situated. You can see Sale down in the bottom there, and there's Bendigo, and there's Melbourne. But the red spot right at the top there, that's the boundary for the Shire, for Ganawara Shire. And that's where we're going to be surveying. We're taking experts in mammals and birds and insects, historians like me, and cultural experts like Kim, and it's going to be wonderful. But I think what makes it most exciting for me as a historian is that we're following in the footsteps of an expedition that actually happened 160 years ago, which is amazing. Um, so in 1950, sorry, 1856, 100 years <laughs> earlier than that, in 1856, the museum's first curator, William Blandowski, left on this expedition which at the time was really important and since is probably the biggest we've ever done. It went for 12 months and they collected 17,000 specimens. I've actually bought a portrait of William Blandowski because he's a bit of a character. This is him, the man in the cape. He looks pretty terrific, doesn't he? He was um, quite the explorer. So this, this trip went for 12 months, as I said, and they collected over 17,000 specimens. And it was a really important expedition. But it's mainly been remembered as the, the, well, I suppose the focus for historians in the past has been on the place they ended up, which was further up the Murray um, at Mondalamin. And what we're doing here is we're going to focus on the bioscan on the area on Gumbower Creek where they were first camped for that wretchedly hot first summer, two months in January of 1857. And we're going to look at the importance around that area. But Kim, perhaps you could tell us, perhaps you could tell us about the, some of the people that he was meeting and working with on the expedition. Sure. So we know that Mr. Blandowski or William Blandowski had a very strong relationship with the Aboriginal people that he was meeting all along his expedition. And 
the Aboriginal people, they were collecting the specimens for William Blandowski. And I think we've got an illustration that we can pull up. And you can see in this picture here, you can see Mr. Blandowski holding up a lizard. And then beside him, sitting down, looking really tired, is uh, Kreft, Mr. Kreft. And he came along to assist Blandowski on his expedition. And all around him, you can see that the Aboriginal people from that area had brought in a lot of the specimens. And that relationship was very strong. And Mr. Blandowski, he needed the Aboriginal people in that area because they have and had at the time then as well expert knowledge on all the animals. So they knew all the different um, species of the animals that were in the area and they knew how to collect them and they knew how to hunt for them. So they worked very closely together um, in collecting all the specimens. That's terrific, Kim. While you were chatting, we've had a question come in from Taylor from Kerrang Technical College. Hi, Taylor. Um, Taylor wants to know what kind of daily life activities did Blandowski record of the Aboriginal people he was working with? That's a really good question, Taylor. We have a lot of beautiful uh, illustrations showing us the daily life of Aboriginal people from that area, from Blandowski's trip. And we have one I think we can show you right now that's up on the screen. And we know that Mr. Blandowski had a very close relationship with the Aboriginal people by all the different scenes and all the different things that he was recording about daily life. So in this picture, we can see down in the corner on the left-hand side, there's women sitting down and they're chewing something and they're chewing a thing called typha, which is like a grass. And you could eat the root of the typha, but what you could also do is make string out of that root. So they would chew it to make it soft and easier to, to work with. And then they would roll it on their knees to make the string. And you can see a little bit further down, sort of near the fire, um, a, a woman is sitting there and she's rolling that on her knees making the string. What we can also see in this picture, it tells us a lot about Aboriginal people and, and the way that they were living back then, is some men in the background holding up a big net. And this net was going to be used for fishing, or is, was used for fishing. And this net was made out of that typha. And then if we move a little bit forward, you can see some um, people there playing, kicking around a ball. And they were playing like a game of football made um, with a ball made out of that typha. So it would bundle all of that, the grass roots together and make a ball. And then what we can also see on the right hand side um, are some men holding up a big catfish. So we're seeing all the different things that were happening at the time what, that Aboriginal people were doing. They were making food, they were making nets, they were catching um, and they were playing sport as well. Great. We have a question from um, Kerrang Technical College student um, and that question is, what was the first specimen found on the expedition? Oh, well that's one I can definitely answer. In fact, I bought a really special treat with me today. People don't usually get to see this, but it's the original catalogue from the expedition, all the specimens that were collected. So this is it here, and I'm about, to, I'm putting gloves on because um, we don't want any of the oils from our fingers to end up on the paper. So I put on the nitrile gloves. This is what it's like to work in a museum. Um, so this catalogue recorded everything that they collected, and it's pretty special. So you can see down the bottom here, it has the total specimens, 17,434 of them. But if we want to know what the first specimen collected was, just really carefully have to turn these pages. And what's the first one? Well, would you look at that? It perfectly describes, it illustrates what Kim was just talking about with the big duck net um, strung across the river. The first specimen caught at Gumbauer was a musk duck. And it would have been collected by those um, same uh, crew people that um, Kim was just mm. talking about in that same method. But these are all specimens that were caught in the area. And so for those schools um, joining us today from the local area, you'd recognise a lot of these locations like Mount Hope, Gunbow Creek. There's a lot of fish here from Gunbow Creek. Um, in fact, one of them is, I think, yes, one of them is the catfish that we were talking about earlier. This is one 
of the documents that I said ended up overseas with Blandowski when he left um, under a cloud of controversy. And so we haven't been able to see these things for a really long time. Most people in Australia would never have seen them. And I was able to photograph them and bring them back. And I think Kim could um, explain to us what's going on in one of them. If we could put that fish illustration up. It's up, great. Kim, can you explain what's going on and the important Koori knowledge that's captured in it? Sure, so what's really exciting about the, the picture that you're seeing right now of the fish is that William Blandowski was capturing the language name for some of these specimens that he was collecting with the Aboriginal people. So we know on this image from the area around Mount Hope, the name of this fish, the, the Aboriginal um, name for this fish is called Wanaki. And then we can track. He goes up a little bit further. He goes, well, quite a long way further, 350 kilometers, kilometers further up. And he arrives on Nyeri Nyeri country. And the name for the same fish up there by the Nyeri Nyeri people is called Kenaru. So it's really exciting that we can be looking at these illustrations by Mr. Blandowski and we can be learning about what the Aboriginal people were calling these animals at the time. Terrific. In fact, in our first people's exhibition here at the museum, we have an amazing interactive map. It's a beautiful sculptural piece carved out of wood. It's so lovely. And when you touch on each of the totems on the map, you can hear the language being spoken. Um, and I think, do we have a resource online, I think? We do. So we have one of these maps online. So you can go on after this session and you can press on the little message sticks that come up on the screen on the map and you can hear the language name for certain areas. So you might press on um, an area near Kerrang and it'll come up saying Barap Barappa. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think you have another question coming in now. I do have another now. question. So Maddie has asked this question and Maddie's from Kerrang Tech. Hi Maddie. Hi, Maddie. And she has asked why was Blandowski's reputation ruined when he came back to Melbourne? Wow, that's a really, really smart question. It's kind of the whole point of the session today, wasn't it? The fishy scandal. Um, well, it's, it's a funny story um, in that Blandowski went off on this amazing expedition. He did extraordinary works and he found all these new species. He got back to Melbourne and the thing scientists would do is describe each species, name them, and then they would publish them. And when it came to the fish, he had discovered 19, what he thought were 19 more new forms of fish from the Murray, which is really exciting in science. And it would have been really exciting to the people of Victoria at the time as well. But when he got back to Melbourne, he had a few scientific enemies, um, you could call them, or you might want to call them frenemies, because they were, some of them were the people that had actually hired him. But, you know, as often is the case sometimes in power and science, they'd, they'd all fallen out. And as a way to kind of get back at some of them, Blandowski did what none of us should do. He did a little bit of name calling. So if we could put up the illustration of the fish that it was at the center of this. You can see it has a really obvious um, sloping forehead and a really big belly. And then if I put up the photo of the person, the picture of the person he named it after, you'll see kind of why he got into trouble. This guy kind of had the sloping forehead and the really big belly too. And he took great offence at the naming of it. His name was Dr Eads. He was a really prominent doctor at the time at Melbourne Hospital. And all the scientific community rallied around him and they took his side. And so it soon ended up in a huge kind of controversy in the media. Um, and in public circles, and in the end, Blandowski had to pack up all his specimens, all his illustrations, and he left Melbourne under a cloud of controversy. It was really unfortunate because that's why a lot of this information has sort of been lost or at least forgotten or interpreted in a different way for so long. But now, hopefully, we're redressing that. But that's kind of the perfect time, I think, for us to cross over to our fish lab upstairs, one of my favourite places. So we're going to cross over live now to Di and Elka in the fish lab. Over to you.
Thanks, Beck and Kim. Now I'm up in the fish lab with one of our experts in marine biology, Diane Bray. Hi, Elka, and hi, kids. Now, Di is our Senior Collections Manager of Vertebrate Zoology. Um, so, Di, tell us about what happens in the fish lab. What sort of work goes on here? So, this is actually a combi combined fish and herp lab. Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians, so we've got a bunch of... Um, reptiles in here as well. What happens in here is we have researchers actually studying fishes from our collection. We also, this is also where we bring in um, new collections that have been preserved and we identify them under the microscope using some of the books that we've got um, in the lab. So all kind of the, the basic research that need, where people look at the fishes and the research that needs to be done on the specimens because we don't do it in, the, in our large collection. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we've got a couple of quite important specimens with us today. What have we got here? We've got a golden perch skin. So this is one of the specimens that was collected on that expedition up to the Murray. Um, as you can see, it's half a skin. So uh, the specimen has been cut in half. The internal organs have been removed, um, leaving the fins intact or half the fins intact on, um, on in some parts. Um, I mean, it's pretty amazing. These were collected in 1857 and they're still in pretty good condition. We can still count scales, we can count fin rays, um, and it's just fantastic to have this material from way back in 1857. The other one we have is a silver perch. So, um, again, a fish that was common in the Murray-Darling Basin at one time. Um, and we've got quite a few of these old dry things from, um, including um, our iconic Murray cod. So they've been preserved that way, removing all the internal organs and just a skin to make them last longer, is that...? Uh, to make them last longer. These sure. days we will um, essentially embalm specimens to put them in the collection. So we, we take a tissue sample for DNA work and then we uh, treat the specimen with formalin, which is embalming fluid. Okay. And then we long-term preserve in ethanol. They didn't have those. Um, that that formalin wasn't used in those days so pretty much if they didn't have some form of alcohol spirits mm -hmm. to preserve things in they had to dry them and on an expedition like that they couldn't carry heaps of preserving fluid with them so they essentially had to dry them and if you try and dry a whole fish you're going to have insides that are going to start going off so this is the best way to preserve it then nice right. and thin and will dry relatively easily good now I notice you're wearing gloves is that is that because they're delicate or...? I am. Both because they're delicate, blue gloves, nitrile gloves, but also um, a lot of our old material has been treated with pesticides because if it wasn't treated that way, insects would just say yum, yum, dried fish skin, yum, all those kind of <laughs> things that like to, like to eat bits like that. So um, this material was probably treated with an arsenic paste mm -hmm. to prevent the insects um, ruining the specimen. So I'm wearing the gloves to protect the specimen so I don't get my oily, sticky hands onto the specimen, but also I don't want to get arsenic paste on me as well. Okay. Now, um, we've got a couple of questions from Kerrang Technical College. The first question is from Maddie. Maddie asks, how many fish were discovered on this expedition? Oh, hi, Maddie. Um, I can't have, I'm not sure of the total numbers, but there are about 13 species that were actually discovered on the expedition, or 13 that Blandowski thought um, he discovered on the expedition. Some things he misidentified because they were, they were juvenile forms. Um, and fishes change throughout their lifestyle, so sometimes they're really, really difficult to identify. Um, but what he brought back was amazing. I mean, it was an amazing snapshot in time of many of the species that occurred in that Murray-Darling Basin. And some of those, at least five, maybe six of those, are now threatened in the Murray-Darling Basin, and they're probably locally extinct in many of the areas of the Murray-Darling Basin due to habitat change and... Um, climate change doesn't help and water loss doesn't help. So um, one of the things that we're going back to do is to see if we can find some of those species that used to occur in that area. Mm, great. Um, you've actually just answered oh. Hannah Dee's question too. So um, are any of those species extinct? And now we know. Um, what You mentioned some names of these. This one's a, 
That's a golden, golden perch? Golden perch, and this one's a... Silver perch. Okay. Now, they're not the only names that they have. They have scientific names as well, don't they? So they are the common names. Mm -hmm. Because we were uh, settled after the, our Aboriginal people lived on the land, we were settled by Europeans. Perch was a common fish in Europe, so many of our fishes are called perch as a common name. So they are the common names. Um, but we also have a scientific scientific names, and scientific names of a species are a two-part name. There's a genus, so the genus for this one, the golden perch is Macquaria, mm -hmm. and the species name is Ambigua. Uh, the genus Macquaria, there's more than one species in the genus, so the genus is a name that refers to closely related species in a in a in a, a family, um, and Blandowski, so. That's called Macquaria ambigua because that is the oldest name that exists. So we have many species have many species that get described more than once, um, and the oldest name has priority. So Macquaria ambigua was is the oldest name. Mm -hmm. Blandowski also gave species names, but the had the had the publication been accepted, and I'm not sure that we've talked about that. But had had Blandowski's publication been accepted. Um, his names wouldn't be the valid names because they were just he would have described them after the okay after the um, so this one was named name. before so this one was scientifically named before and it's important that each species has one valid scientific name yeah. sometimes there's a bit of a dispute as to which one that should be mm -hmm. um, and names change because we do genetic work and we find out that one what, what we've called one species might be more than one but in an ideal world each species has one scientific name okay um, so Macquaria sounds like it was named maybe after a person or a place, is that right? Probably after Governor Macquarie, but I would have to check that one. Okay. And Ambigua, maybe? Um, ambiguous. Um, yeah. Something ambiguous about this fish. Yes. Okay. So it's interesting how they end up with their, their final um, scientific names. Final, yeah, yeah. And some final, and sometimes scientific names are amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a seahorse that, that had the name been valid would have been called Philopiscus. <laughs> which is pretty cool. <laughs> that is pretty cool. So you have these two specimens from collected from that expedition. Um, are they the, these the only two that we have in? No, the we've museum? got we've got quite a few collected from this expedition. Um, they have been used. We've had researchers come and look at this material to write, um, essentially papers on the Blandowski mm -hmm. expedition. But also, they would be material from this would potentially be available for genetic studies. If somebody was to look at the population genetics of a species over time, especially since um, so many of our fishes in the Murray-Darling Basin are regionally extinct, so that somebody can do ancient population genetics by taking, any, taking a piece of this, um, you know, a very, very small piece, a little bit of destructive testing from the back side of the fish so that we don't notice it and not some of the identifying features um, can be used for a population genetics study if, if um, somebody wish to do that. So even though these are 160 years old and even though they're being treated with arsenic and salt and other things possibly too, we could still maybe get some DNA absolutely. from them. Oh, absolutely. No guarantee but absolutely. And look our collections are really a bunch of dead specimens in our collection but to me it's a biological library. It's a living library because they're still giving up their stories hundreds of years after they were actually collected. Fantastic. Well thank you very much Di. My pleasure. And we'll throw back to Beck and Kim. Wow, thanks Elka and Di, that's amazing. Di, I had no idea there was a seahorse almost named after Farlap. That's so interesting, thanks so much. Now while we've been crossed over live upstairs to the fish lab, we've had a question come in from the Mayor of Ganawara Shire, Councillor Lorraine Lemont. So we're just gonna quickly cross to her question. Go ahead, Lorraine. What type of animal do you expect to find? Wow, that is just the perfect question because I have the perfect person here to answer that. Let me introduce Patrick Honan. Patrick's the uh, manager of our live exhibits team here at the museum. And you might not realise, but the museum has, or and Patrick's team, look after over 120 species of live animals here at the museum. So, Patrick, to Lorraine's question, yep. what do you think our team will find? The kind, what kind of animals are we likely to find when we go up there? 
Well, there's a whole range of animals that can be found, um, and we'll be looking for um, invertebrates, so things like insects and spiders, but also fish, uh, frogs, reptiles, birds, mammals, the whole lot. And a lot of those we have here at the museum in the live exhibits unit. Um, for example, uh, we've got fish in our ponds here, one of which is the Macquarie perch, um, which is uh, found all through the, the Murray-Darling Basin, including around Kundruk and Kahuna and, and places like that. Um, I think one of, the, one of the themes you'll find from today, the animals I brought, is that although these animals in Blandowski's time were very common, and even though they were eaten by local people, these days a lot of them um, are not so common, and some of them have become threatened. So the Macquarie perch is a good example. Uh, they're uh, endangered in Victoria, um, and that's mainly because of the uh, fish that have been introduced in the last 150 years or so. So things like trout and carp in particular. Um, Macquarie perch grow to uh, about 50 centimetres long. The ones you can see here are about a year old, so they're still babies. And, uh, that's pretty big, isn't uh, it? It is. I think there's a python in their way. At the <laughs> Look at what we've got here. This is wonderful. So this is another um, animal that you find up around the Murray in, in this particular region. And this is a Murray-Darling carpet python. Um, or it's also called a Victorian python because it's only one of two pythons that you get in Victoria. The other one is the diamond python. Um, and they, these are found all through the forest. Uh, up that way, and particularly around rivers. Uh, and again, because of uh, the impact of people on these areas, um, these pythons aren't as common as they used to be. And again, in Victoria, they're, they're listed as threatened. Wow, I, I actually recognise this guy from some of Landowski's illustrations. Can we yes. put up that illustration from uh, earlier of the um, quarry uh, collectors bringing the specimens to the tent, it's up great. So you'll see that there's pythons in that one. There's also this awesome story from that trip where Blandowski at the end of the trip put, it was kind of like your first live exhibits at the museum actually. Yes. Do you know this story where he put it in the suitcase yes. and packed it off to McCoy <laughs> at the museum, one of another one of his frenemies, and McCoy wasn't much of an outdoor naturalist, was yeah. he? And it scared him to death when he opened it, opened this package that came in from the bush and apparently he shut the lid on the, on the suitcase and he shoved it away because he was so terrified. <laughs> well, a lot of people are terrified of snakes. I'll just pick this one up. This one is called Murray, somewhat unimaginatively. <laughs> Murray from the Murray. <laughs> yeah. So as you can see, he's a very friendly snake. Wow. You probably don't want to do this with any pythons you find in the wild. But pythons in general are non-venomous and they tend to be friendlier than a lot of the more venomous snakes. Um, and I don't know if you can get in close with this, but you can see underneath the head, just where my finger's pointing, there's a, a row of pits that look a bit like teeth. Yeah. And so those are heat sensors. And so that's what they, the pythons use to find their prey at night. Um, they're really well adapted to the environment. They feed on um, small mammals uh, like uh, rodents and small native marsupials. Um, but unfortunately, the numbers aren't so good. And I think what we need to think about is that these animals, we've still got them, and you can see how important and precious they are. But we also have to make sure that the future generations will have them as well. So we need to really look after them and look after their habitat. What sort of things... Um do we need to do to support the habitat? Uh, a, a lot of the areas around there um, have been turned from natural bush into farmland, um, and particularly in places like Gumbau, but they've, they've um, been allowed to return to bush again, but they're full of weeds, for example. And so the uh, weeds are plants that a lot of the animals there can't eat, whereas they can eat the native plants, but also um, a lot of animals can't live in there and the, and the weeds outcompete the other native plants and so on. Uh, in this case, it's predation by foxes is a big one. So a lot of the issues aren't directly caused by people, but they're caused by the animals and plants that people have brought up there. Mm -hmm. Introduced. So, yeah, so, so the pest plants and animals. 
I think um, Kim has some questions. Yeah, we've got okay. some good questions coming in. So we have one from Dylan at St. Joseph's, and he asks, how many different species were found on the expedition? Look, I don't know the breakdown for species. I only have the specimen numbers, I'm afraid. Um, like I said, there were more than 17,000 specimens. But oh, look, off the top of my head, I, look, there, I know there were 19 different species of fish, um, there were quite, obviously quite a few mammal forms. I'm, I'm really not sure. I can't answer that one for you. Sorry. Well, Guernica has a question also from um, St. Joseph's. And the question is, did any specimens shock them? Was there any shocking specimens? Well, I think, this, I think the python in the suitcase shocked McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, look, I think, uh, I think what was happening along the expedition um, Blandowski had such a thirst for knowledge. I don't think he would have been so much shocked as he would have been just inspired from all the new animals that he was seeing and documenting. Don't you agree? And delighted. Delighted. By what, what's found up that way. Yeah, there's just so much. And there would have been so even more diversity at the time. We have another question also from St. Joseph's, from Alex. And the question is, how did the people on the expedition communicate with the Aboriginal people? That's a really good question. And by that time, Aboriginal people were also speaking English. Um, so they had their first language as well, and then they were also speaking English. So I would imagine that Mr. Blandowski and Kreft were, were able to talk to the Aboriginal people in English. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point that at the moment in our work, the Kim and I, we're considering because if you think about it, Blandowski was a European here. He was uh, a German speaker and he was speaking a second language in English and the Kuri people he was working with, they were speaking a second language in English and he was sharing their first language with someone in, the, in their second language. So there's a whole lot of really important work that we think needs to be done around picking apart those translations. But I think Patrick's got some other great um, animals to show us, actually. I do. I just put Murray down, okay. if you'll let me. Uh, in here is another animal that's not as happy as Murray to be handled. Oh, this is and wonderful. And could well poo on me. <laughs> so this is a Macquarie turtle, also called a Murray uh, short neck turtle. And these are found all the way along the Murray. In, usually in deep pools, um, and they're quite long-lived. They, they take about 15 years to get to adulthood. This one's probably around 20 years old. Uh -huh. um, and there's two turtles up that way. One is the um, snake neck or long neck turtle, and the other one is the Macquarie turtle. Mm. Again, I think that's in the illustration at the tent, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. And some of these animals would have also been the, the totems for Aboriginal people that were living along the Murray. So I know my totem for the Yorta Yorta people are the long neck turtles. Yes, and this one has a, a local Indigenous name, which I can't remember at the moment. It's a, it was one of those long names that's a bit hard to remember, but not only does it have a name, but it also provides a lot of food. Um, a good supply of food. But again, like the other animals, um, these turtles will be nesting pretty soon and they come out of the water and nest on the banks and foxes come along and dig up their eggs. So although we have a lot of these turtles in Victoria, especially around the Murray, and they're quite secure, it's an ageing population because the young ones aren't coming through to replace the older ones. Wow. And so you think our team will come across nesting? Yes, the, the nests are quite common and, and each female can lay 70 or 80 eggs wow. in, in a season. Um, she'll do that a few times. The, the rain that's up there at the moment and, and the flooding yeah. might help because it'll make the soil easier to dig, but it will also um, keep some areas free from foxes because they'll be surrounded by water. Right. So it, it varies from season to season. Yeah, that's another really important thing to keep in mind about our survey as opposed to the survey that Blandowski did. So we're going at um, the point where there's water, flood water everywhere, as those of you who live up there know at the moment, you've got a lot of rain coming on. And Blandowski was there at perhaps the driest time in, well, the hottest time in January and February. So that might have, that will show that we'll probably find very different things than yep. he did at the time. Beck, I've got another great question from Curtis, yeah. and 
He asks, how well known was Blandowski in 1856? Oh, he was so, he was, he was really famous, really, in Melbourne. Because if you think about it, think about the cape and that stare. He was this really interesting, enigmatic, that's a big word for a fancy, <laughs> fancy man. He was, he was, um, he was very flamboyant and really interesting. And the reason he was probably most famous was our museum was where everybody came to understand what well, all the um, Europeans who were um, coming to Australia at the time, to Victoria, were coming to the museum to understand the new world they found around them and the animals. And Blandowski was at the centre of that. So he was sort of like the David Attenborough of the time, I suppose. And I can imagine he was a pretty interesting David Attenborough. How, how did the museum get the drawings back that we have? Um, so the ones that I showed pictures of, I recently went on um, a trip to um, Berlin, to the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Shout out to Berlin if anyone is watching. They hosted me. It was a wonderful trip. And that's where all of Blandowski's material ended up that he took with him. But recently, Kim and I collected here in Australia from a sale actually in Germany, some of his... Um, Prince, which is uh, uh, the way he published some of his uh, illustrations. We purchased some of those earlier this year, didn't we? And they are magnificent um, prints from the fir very first expeditions that the museum conducted in Victoria. Mm. So, Patrick, I think we might have a little bit more time for one more show and tell. One more animal? And if okay. we think about that, that picture that we've been seeing of Blandowski holding up the lizard and all the animals around him. What have we got now? Well, this is one lizard that he might have found up there. This is called an inland bearded dragon. Oh, wow. And this, this part of the Murray uh, is probably the most southerly extent of where these lizards are found. So there's bearded dragons found throughout Victoria, um, and they're the eastern bearded dragons. This one's an inland one, so it's more adapted to the arid parts of the country. Um, and as I said, any further south, and, you, and they'll be replaced by the eastern bearded dragon. So it's entirely possible that this is one of the species that was found. We have drawings of lizards um, in, the, in the general scenes, but the drawings aren't really detailed enough for us to tell what sort of lizards they are. We know, for example, the pythons in the drawings have to be the Murray-Darling carpet pythons that we saw earlier, because they're the only pythons that have existed in that area. But there's a lot of different lizards. Um, and also, you might be familiar with the smaller skinks that you find around that area, um, as well as the, the dragons that are a bit bigger and a, a bit more tricky to hold. <laughs> but one other animal I'll, I'll show you, which is completely different, is a shingleback. So this is, a, again, a, a, an animal that's found in more drier areas of the state and uh, of New South Wales, but they do come um, as far south as the region around the Murray. And you can see from its tongue that it's closely related to blue tongue lizards as well. So these are known as shinglebacks or two-headed lizards because the tail looks very much like the head. Nice. Um, and they're also known as sleepy lizards because that's what they do an enormous amount of. So these are sort of lizards that are still found around that area um, and that would have definitely been collected at the time. And neither of these are, or both of these, I, sh I should say, are particularly common, so they're still quite secure. Terrific. Thank you so much, Patrick. My pleasure. I think we might have to wrap up around there. Um, um, it's been wonderful to have you here today. Um, I'd like to thank the team today, Kim and Patrick, um, and I'd also like to thank Elka and Di who are still up in the fish lab. Um, and for all of you for joining us, thank you so much and a shout out to everybody at the Kerrang Community Centre. We're really looking forward to seeing and meeting all of you when we come up to Ganawara Shire for the Bioscan from the 10th of October. And during that time, uh, for all the schools, please remember that our education team, led by Elka, who you met earlier in the fish lab, is running a schools day at the Kahuna 
the Kahuna Memorial Hall, um, and you can get details about that from MV Teachers. And I hope we get to meet you all there. Thanks for joining us and see you next time. See ya. See you later. Bye. Bye.